My name is Karnik Tomasian. Well, it was uh, summer of 1942, and I thought, well, my goodness, I think I'll go and see if I can get a job at Brewster Aircraft riveting. So I went to Delahanty School and started to learn how to rivet and got a job. And I was working, and uh, suddenly the whistle blew, and all the guys walked off, and I just kept working. And the uh, head union guy came and said, hey, guy, what are you working for? Well, I, I don't smoke, so I work. He says, listen, you want to join the union, you better get out and take a smoke or, or something. Just stop working. I said, what the hell's the matter with you? We were in the war. So he walked off, and I, I went in, and a week later I quit. And that's when I went into the Army. I joined, and I wasn't good enough to go to, uh, because of my eyes, to go to flight school. So instead, <clears throat> I went into basic training and from there to uh, into electrical specialist school, engineering, stuff like that. And I was doing so well in my marks that they offered a, uh, an assignment, if I would take it, of a new plane that was the newest plane on the earth. Nobody knows about it. We can't tell you what it is. Would you like to do it? I said, absolutely. All right, we would like to take you, since you did so well in electrical specialist school, to uh, take the flight engineer's course. Okay. We went into Seattle, Washington, where the B-29 was being built. It was all civilian engineers that was teaching us all about the B-29. So we saw a strut, enormous strut, big wheels. Everything was enormous. Someone heard of engines roaring down in the valley. And so we all ran out after hearing the engines roaring, <coughs> and we saw a B-17, and behind it was a B-29. It roared, I mean roared, and verily jumped off the still plate, ran a little bit down and up like a fighter. I tell you, the place went bananas. We were all uh, examined and everything, and naturally I'm dealing with college grads and so on, so it was pretty obvious I'm going to flunk out, so I did. <laughs> They sent me to uh, B-29 gunnery. So I learned how the mechanics of shooting with a sight rather than the actual gun. And I did very well there. Finally went to uh, Salina, Kansas, where we formed crews. And I got a terrific uh, pilot. And eventually, when we were about to be released to go overseas, they said, you're losing your pilot. You're going to get another guy. And this other guy came in, and he looked like a, I don't know, a corn husker, you know. But let me tell you, that man had more in his finger than a lot of pilots had in their whole body. And so we went into training with him. We got a call to go to uh, Kansas City to the, uh, uh, the plant where they had the planes, and we got our own plane, trained a little bit in it. He even let me fly the plane a little bit. It was a funny little incident. He says, yeah, Tommy, you called me Tommy because they couldn't remember my carnage. <laughs> so, sure. So the co-pilot got up, and I sat in there, and I'm, boy, I'm really flying this big plane. And pretty soon, I know I happen to look up, and I say, "Oh, Doc, uh, there are clouds ahead. You want to take over?" He says, "Tommy, you've been spying instruments ever since you got in the plane. Go right through it." <laughs>
because I should be. You should be looking around you. You don't put your eye on the instruments all the time. Another lesson. I get lessons all my life. Our day came to go overseas. We went overseas, went to Berinquin Field, and uh, went to Puerto Rico. Then we flew to Brazil. And from there, after a month layover, because we had a leak in our tank, gas tank, they had to fly another tank down to repair it. So we were a month later, other planes that went on were already on missions, and we were just coming in. So we get there finally after much delay, and we're getting our bed, bedding and everything. There was a gray box there, and McCutcheon, my right gunner, he says, hey, Tommy, look at this, missing in action. You can get killed out here. I said, hey, you're just getting to realize that now? <laughs> So uh, we finally went on our mission. Our whole function there was to disrupt Japanese from the Indian base over the Himalayas, land in China at our forward bases. There were four of them. Gas up and go on doing a mission, return gas up, come back over the hump. It's, a, it's an enormous mission, long. We did this twice. Second time, we almost had to go to Russia because one of the engines filed up. But we all took a vote. He says, you want to go try to get back or go to Russia? I said, back. So we, we made it back. The next week, we got a call for a mission to Rangoon, no, to Bangkok, Thailand. And uh, we went and got our directions. And the directions were this. We're going to bomb the railway yards and the bridge that had to be detonated on impact, so be no fuses. So time came for loading the bombs. We need a thousand pounders to bomb the bridge. Five hundreds wouldn't do it. So we're on the mission. We go to Bangkok, Thailand, and it's cloud covered. Once, twice, three times, that's it. All right, we go to a secondary target, Rangoon, Burma. We still have those same bombs with no fuses. Now, it doesn't take rocket scientists to figure out that if you stack one on top of the other of two demonstrably different weights, if this is a 1,000-pounder a and this is a 500, it's going to go like this. And that's exactly what happened. So we had 11 planes over the target, and then... When the time came for releasing the bombs, I remember saying, bombs away. And I looked at the bomb bay, all of a sudden, enormous, I mean, such an enormous explosion. And what I didn't know was our plane, here's our plane, and here's the other plane below us, and we flipped like this and under him. And the guy here remembers, because we talked to him later, he says, I thought we had it. It, it was that close. And then we straightened out and we went into a, like this, a flat, a flat spin into a bigger spin, you know, an outer spin all the way down. And it's faster than I thought it was. However, after the blast or our compression, well, it escaped. The patch blew open, everything. We had four engines on fire. It, it, was, it was terrible. And 
all I could see, I looked at the, I'm at the bomb bay because I'm watching to see if the bombs are out. It was my duty to tell the bombardier that, hey, there's a bomb hung up so he could do something. So all the bombs were out. Then I turned around and all this happened. And I happened to have my shoot on, which is fine, but my top gunner didn't. His chute was right next to it, where the door opened and hit it, you know, the Bombay door. And so his feet were on my shoulder. He said, Tommy, get out of the way. Okay. So I had to jump, and I tried to jump, but my chest buckle wouldn't buckle. It just couldn't. I, I injured my hand somehow. I, don't ask me how. So I figured, stupid me, I'll hold it in. <laughs> stupid me, you can't hold in that power. So as I think, my shoulder strap just pulled my arms back, ripped it. And to this day, I still have injured arm. And uh, I hung by my legs. I had suntans on. So... There I was hanging upside down. I don't remember anything between the time I threw myself out. And I don't remember pulling the cord. All I remember is being upside down. So I climbed up as best I could and put one arm through one of the armholes, and that's how I went down. Meantime, the Japs are shooting at us for part target practice. And I remember in my shroud, there was a, if a shroud is like this, there was a, a V like this. He must have, so I'm still okay, very strong fibers. <laughs> so anyway, I landed on this side of the river. The other side of the river is our target, Rangoon. And our plane, as I'm watching it, it rolling and rolling. I said, Jesus, please, some more shoots. And there were no more shoots. And I knew I had lost some really dear friends. So I landed, ripped off my medical pack and started to take three, four steps to get away towards the Indian Ocean, which was about 100 miles, and then I would go up and go to Misera Island, and apparently there was radio there that we could find. We were all alerted to this. How am I going to do this? <laughs> Impossible. Anyway, they caught me right then and there, all these natives with spears and knives and everything. Uh, and then the Japanese came, thank goodness, and they took my 45 from my holster and tied me up. And then I walked with them back to the tender, and I met my co pilot, and he was already caught. And we, they took us with new, the Japanese newsreels filming us across the river, which wasn't. It wasn't, it wasn't even half the distance of our Hudson River. It was very uh, narrow. And then we went up into their building. And there we met our other guys that had bailed out. And we realized that we lost five terrific guys, including our pilot. So uh, these were all, I don't know how to explain it, but at that moment, you are so in shock that you don't, how can I say, you don't go into details about the pain you're feeling about losing friends. This came later. Right now, you're, your whole focus is to find a way to live through this and observe everything. At least that's what my mind would. 
So finally, they put us downstairs in um, in the cages, and uh, the first day, I'm uh, told you. Whenever a guard comes by, you have to stand at attention. I said, okay. And so I tried my best to do that. But after a while, I guess sleep took over, and I don't know what happened. I ended up on the floor, sound asleep. They didn't do anything. Thank God. We took us out in the courtyard. A big Japanese guy, bare-chested with a sword, he's waving over his head. And we're all tied up and bitten on our knees like this, you know? What the hell are you gonna expect? Oh boy, this is it, you know? Uh, so fortunately, the commandant came and they read, an interpreter read it in English that we are going to be transported to the POW camp. And that's when this guard and the other guards started laughing and staying because they knew they scared the crap out of us. And so they took us out into a, like a pickup truck and shipped us over there. And we went there and we had to all sign paper that we would not try to escape. I didn't think much of it. I said, sure, I'll try everything. But one guy, Lieutenant Coffin, he was a wonderful man. He refused. He didn't want to lie. He was a very religious guy. And I, I just marveled at this man. He was one of the pilots. And oh boy, they beat him and everything. And so finally the guys advised him, look, just sign it, it doesn't mean anything to us. Whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. So, and that night we had nothing. So uh, we went to sleep, the guards left, and we were about two, three, and four to a cell because their 28 men were captured. Can you imagine what a incredible, that whole flight practically. One plane got destroyed completely, men and all. And during the day, it, they made it very clear when a guard goes by, you better stand at attention and look straight ahead. And uh, one day I was taking a snooze and Brooksy, my buddy said, get up, get up, he's gonna come any minute now. So I go, what, what? And I got up and I, just in time, thank God. So that was all right. Then another time, I don't know why, he took a shine to me, this, what we called a guy named Tarzan. He was the worst of the lot. Little short fellow, I could have mushed him. But he said, Thomason, up. So I had to go out and stand our attention in front of us. So all the other guys are watching what's going on. Orkado, Orkado or means it's all right to do. He's going to shoot me. Yeah. I said, go ahead. I didn't know what to say. What the man? So he clicked. Nothing happened. And he started laughing. He shoved me back into the thing and went down the hall laughing. That was his. Boy, oh boy. Finally came the time when the Indian National Army were their, were their partners in, in this war, they left the one compound. When they left the one compound, they decided to put us all, everybody that's in the uh, 
solitary confinement into that compound, which frankly was a blessing because there we could cook our own rice, walk around, and not mess around and do crazy things. And so that's the way we spent the next four or five months. We weathered the storm until the time came when the British were coming down from Mandalay and the Japs decided they have to leave. So they left with a cordon of people from our prison that could walk. I couldn't walk because I had a a big ulcer on my ankle. If I walk and I can't keep up, they're gonna shoot me. So I'll take my chances, I'll stay here with the others. And I did, and it worked out fine. One night we realized the Japs had gone, just left. So we said, are you sure? So the wing commander and I, we went, I said, look, I know how to open this uh, lock here. And we went all the way to the front of it and could, we could see right out into the street. The big, massive doors were open. So, <laughs> so finally, wing commander and I, we got a few others and we said, I think we gotta go over the wall here. So we hiked each other over the wall, our little wall between the compounds and then ran. I said, don't run, they may be boobed. So let's go get a cow. So we went and we got a cow from the back and we steered it around, let the cow meander around the, and everything was fine. He went out into the thing. We ran and closed the big, massive doors and blocked it. All right, now we looked around for guns and things and so on. Meantime, we have food now. And so the British who were captured had cooks, bakers, they had everything, uh, the knowledge of it. Not that they could do anything about it, but now they could because they had the cows, so they, they chopped and they made food. I tell you, my jaw ached. Oh, did they ache. I chewed on that, but it was delicious. And soon, a uh, American newspaper man came to, knocked on the door. And I said, boy, who is this? And he came in, and we're all crowding around him, a big, tall guy. He looked so healthy, I tell you. <laughs> it was incredible. And what made it more incredible was that he stood up in front of us, and all of us around him looked so pale. That's when I really realized that we looked pale. Otherwise, I didn't think there was anything wrong with us. But it was contrary to the truth. So he got everything, all the information from us. We said, look, we got to notify the British that, uh, oh, they're, they're coming now. They're going to send the Gurkhas down. And sure enough, the Gurkhas, within hours, came down. You know what the Gurkhas are? The Gurkhas are Indians. Uh, the Indian... Indian government hires the Gurkhas, fierce, fierce fighters. They hire them, pay them, and they retire them for life. They have these curved blades. And if you want to see the blade, he's got to prick your finger. He said, I have to draw blood. I don't care for you. Chair, you tell me where you want me to prick it up to. That's the way they were. And they, they're really the little short fellas, but whoa, were they fierce. But to us, they were our friends. So uh, we, got, we got fine then. Then the British came with a boat, um, a hospital ship, and a tender came to the dock 
And so they said, okay, guys, everybody that can walk, the others will help. And we go out to the boat and we get on the hospital ship and we'll, we'll go to Calcutta. And that's just what happened. We got into the hospital ship and there they hosed us down and deloused us with hoses. We stripped down, threw all our clothes out the window into the ocean. And uh, I managed to keep my flight jacket. And they took care of the sores. Oh, that jungle sore. In about when I was in the hospital, four days. So after a month, we ate on the table was a bowl like this full of different colored vitamins. And we just grab and eat amongst food and stuff like that. We had excellent food. And I went over and saw the Chinese, and this one Chinese boy, he was there, and I said, through an interpreter, he didn't understand me, I didn't understand him. But this one interpreter, I said, look, tell him that he is, instrumental in making my time bearable here, the way he doled out the food in the morning with, with the watchful eye of the guard. He had to be careful, otherwise he'd be beaten. We finally got to Calcutta, and that's when we again went and had wonderful meals and they did everything. And time came for us, those that were well, as they got better, they flew home on a C-47. They said, look, you got an option. You can go and live on the Taj Mahal in a, in a houseboat for a month. And then we'll ship you first via the Pacific, California, and on to New York. I said, not for me. I want to go home. So that's exactly what I did. So we got on the C-47. Finally, we got near New York, and the pilot said, I want you to all look out the right side window of your airplane. And then he banked, went down, went around the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> it was magnificent. You can't. You can't make these stories up. It's just incredible. <laughs> anyway, we got back, and I find out, well, I'm going to get out, right? Well, uh, sir, I'm sorry, uh, Sergeant, but you got three more points to get. You only have 82. What are you talking about? I mean, I couldn't make that or such. They finally got it through to me. So I said, all right, well, send me down to Clovis, New Mexico, and then where they got B-29s. All right. So I did. They didn't have any B-29s there. I lost my luggage on the train. In the meantime, it went to California. So when I got on base, I didn't have anything, no waters, no nothing, just my toothbrush and shaving gear. So I talked to the guys, uh, the guards, and they took me to the headquarters, and the head guy said, all right, when you get your baggage, come in and check us in. I said, all right, thank you, sir. And then he said, why don't we stay in the meantime? You go to a transient barracks and look on the bulletin board. Yeah, I said, that's what he did for a month and a half, almost two months, and pretty soon it became three months. And my bags came, and I didn't look them. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I just, <laughs> but then finally I got home. Make a long story short, I finally got home, got discharged. And uh, when I was at Fort Dix, I saw German POWs. 
They were smoking cigarettes, having candy bars, sweeping the streets. I said, wow, this is incredible. So I got home and uh, I got, I don't know, you know anything about the subways in New York? Yeah. Well, 190th Street, it's a very deep subway. Uh, so you got an elevator up. So I got up, went around the corner where there was a uh, ice cream parlor. And along comes a Spalding ball. Well, it's pink balls, you know. So I grab it and I got my duffel bag with me. And this kid comes up with a bat bigger than his head. And he's like, give me the ball or I'll waltz one up your snot box. <laughs> I'm home! <laughs> well, anyway, I did. I was home. And I met my parents. Oh, I tell you, there's nothing like home. Now, having said all we've talked about, I think we have to give credence to one thing and that we should never, never forget those that gave of their lives, gave of their time, men or women. And women, they did an awful lot. And I think if you've been listening to the things that have been going on here, you probably know as much as I do. I think CAF, to my mind at least, has established where they stand and in the area of communicating to the public the history as well as the responsibility for the future.